morning, everyone. I'm Lauren Trevine from the University of Minnesota, and I'm the SIGTI Vice President for Membership and Communications. And one of the happy duties of this job is to form a committee each year to select the recipient of the SIGTI Social Impact Award. This award recognizes work that promotes the application of human-computer interaction research to pressing social needs. Now this award says something about what we value in our community. It says technical excellence is not the whole story, that addressing human and societal needs is also crucial. And how fitting it is then that this year's winner of the SIGTI Social Impact Award is Bacha Friedman. Um, Bacha is a professor in the Information School at the University of Washington, and she pioneered value-sensitive design. Now this approach to design tells us that functional requirements also don't tell the whole story, that human values must be accounted for in design. In her talk today, she'll reflect on her work, the lessons from it, and identify some challenges that need to be addressed to further its impact. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Bacha. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Can everybody hear? I can't actually see in the back there, but great. Well, thank you very much for coming. I am um, delighted to be here and spend a little bit of time with you today um, talking about something of value. Um, I'd like to uh, start by dedicating this talk to my daughter Zoe, who's here, but also to all of the other young people across the globe and those who are yet to come for whom the systems we are building now will have long um, impacts, lasting impacts that ripple forward. And I'd also like to take a moment to thank um, a group of individuals who believed in me and supported me long before I had a body of work that merited such support. So to those, I say thank you. But what I'd like to do today is um, spend a bit of time uh, in some reflection, sharing with you some personal experiences, um, perhaps some strategic decisions that I've made along the way, um, point to uh, some openings for the field, and in the course of doing that, visit some content, both about um, value-sensitive design and then also about a new research program in multi-lifespan information system design. So um, that's the game plan for the next, oh, 55 minutes or so, and then I hope that we'll have time for some conversation about some of the um, things that we'll bring um, into the fore here. So I'd like to start with um, a personal story. This is um, a story in my life where I first, in a deep way, became aware that there was a human face on responsible innovation and that as scientists and designers we're engaged in creating the direction in which our science and our technology and design and innovation go forward. So um, I'd like to read you something that comes from the Russell Einstein Manifesto. This was written in 1955. This was before I was born. And in that manifesto, which came out of the scientists who were reflecting on the design of the atomic bomb, so reflecting on the Manhattan Project, they had come together in Pugwash, Nova Scotia because they had serious concerns about the kind of science that was done and what the implications of that science would be for the globe and for humankind going forward. So just to read from that manifesto a small bit, remember your humanity. There lies before us, if we choose, continual progress in happiness, knowledge, and wisdom. Shall we instead choose death because we cannot forget our quarrels. We appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. So my encounter with this came much later. Um, the people who were writing this manifesto, people like Russell and Einstein, but also Joseph Rotlet, were getting older. I imagine they were sitting around, looking around the table at each other and noticing that they were all in their late 60s and early 70s and wondering who was going to take that mantle forward. 
And so they formed a student pugwash conference that was originally funded by the National Science Foundation. And they invited young scientists to that conference to talk about issues of responsible science and innovation. And I had the privilege of attending one of those. And at that conference, I remember sitting at a cafeteria table with Joseph Rotblad and Bernie Feld and talking with them and being able to ask them questions like, well, what was it like to be at Los Alamos? When did you first start to feel uncomfortable? What was that discomfort like? What were the social pressures when you had a charismatic leader who continued to try to bring people together to continue the work? And in Joseph Rothblatt's case, he chose to leave. So what led him to leave, and then what were the implications thereafter? And in some cases, some of those scientists chose to change their fields of study. Um, pretty profound choice. And again, they were trying to choose fields of study where they thought that the new knowledge that they would create would be used for benefit to society or less likely to lead to harms. And at the same time, they recognized that as people who generate new knowledge, there is no way for us to be able to control how that knowledge will be used by others in the future. So that was, in my life, a very, um, I think, important opportunity to see that there were human beings who were making these choices about the science and innovation that we do, and that all of us in our personal lives make these choices for ourselves, and we make these choices for our fields. So I'd like to go from that then to talking about, well, what have I been doing with my life? <laughs> um, so uh, my, my investigations start from an observation that um, tool use is a fundamental part of the human condition. Somewhere along the line, we as primates picked up something and used it for something, and tool use became a fundamental part of what we do. Our tools shape how we interact with and experience the world, and that in turn shapes and leads to new tools. And as um, Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores wrote in 1986, in designing tools, we are designing ways of being. For me, that little phrase speaks volumes. It means not only are we designing small things that we do to enhance our abilities to make us stronger or faster, but that we fundamentally change the milieu in which we live our lives. We change the way in which we communicate with each other, in which we raise our children, in which we care for the elderly, in which we shape our communities. So um, just to start the conversation, I thought, start with one of my um, favorite tools, this nice screwdriver here. Um, in thinking about tools, and I often find it helpful to go back to some really simple tools to think. Even when we're thinking about very complex digital tools or tools that move between digital and non-digital environments. Um, so this tool, this tool is very good if I have a screw to turn. Um, uh, it's nice, I've used it actually to dig holes in the ground by my house when I want to plant tulip bulbs, it works for that. I have also used it as a lever on some occasion. However, this is not particularly useful if the thing I want to do is ladle soup. And so what it brings home is that the shape of the tools that we build um, lead themselves to support certain kinds of activities and perhaps not other activities. And the same can be said about the value implications of our tools. So take, for example, email, something that everyone here in this room is very familiar with. Um, email, in its initial forms, came without status cues. So when you got a piece of email, you don't know who you're receiving it from. Uh, you don't know if it's a man, you don't know if it's a woman, if it's a child, if it's a full professor from a university, unless you know the name of that person, until you open up that email and read it. And in that way, it allowed for communication to cross hierarchical boundaries. Um, other kinds of tools, like, um, well, for now, we are thinking about new ways of doing work. We're thinking about um, crowdsourcing work and something like Mechanical Turk. Well, Mechanical Turk puts on the table for us, what is a quota, what is a unit of meaningful work? It also puts on the table for us, what is fair compensation for a unit of meaningful work? So the tools that we build carry with them value implications. 
We can think about it also in terms of um, buildings. When we think about buildings, there was a time when if you were in a wheelchair, you often couldn't get into a building. But we can proactively design those buildings so that people in wheelchairs can come into them. Now, there is a question as to whether those people in wheelchairs will be able to work in those buildings, and that relies on the people who are employers in those buildings hiring people who are in wheelchairs. So as designers and people who are inventors of new technology, we have a certain piece towards solving some of these problems, but we do not contain all of the solution. And we need to work in larger ways with society for these kinds of changes to come about. But just as if people who were building buildings didn't put in ways for people in wheelchairs to go into those buildings, then there is no opportunity for that work to happen. So too, as we design digital technologies and infrastructure, if we don't design ways for people who might not see as well or might not have motor skills as well, to be able to access those infrastructures and opportunities, then surely they won't. So we have a critical role to play, even as we don't determine what goes forward. So from that, I would just like to remind us that technology shapes interaction, which shapes human experience and vice versa. So this is an iterative and integral thing. It enables what's easy to do. It hinders those things that are hard to do but are doable. And in some cases, it prevents. It can make certain sorts of things impossible. So with that as a, as a background, here's the question um, that I have been asking myself for a long time now. How do you design tools and infrastructure so that they're more likely to support the actions, relationships, and experiences that human beings care deeply about? So that is a huge question. <laughs> it's certainly not one that I expect um, to answer in my lifetime, but it is one that I hope to get traction on. And in trying to get traction on it, it isn't one that I would attempt to answer alone. So I'd like to point to some people that I think with. These are the people that I build on. These are the books, some of the books that I've read very carefully. I've studied not only the ideas that are here, but I've studied the structure of the arguments. How are the theoretical claims laid out? What is the relationship between the evidence that's presented? How do people go forward in their arguments? It also means that I don't necessarily agree with what these authors are saying or how they've structured their arguments, but they're the people that I have been learning from, and they are people who sit on my shoulder as I'm trying to do the work that I have been doing. So for example, Hannah Arendt reminds me that from any technology or any act that we take, there are unanticipated ripple effects. And if that's the case, that means if we're going to be proactive on design, we need to design where it's normal for there to be unanticipated ripple effects and to take that into account in our design processes. Uh, Michel Foucault talks to me about power and the fact that whoever controls the language or the medium of expression has an enormous amount of power and others, whether they can speak or what they can say can be constrained by the others who control the ways in which they can express their ideas. Uh, Jürgen Habermas talks to me about the possibility for evolution of society. The idea is that we can, from the position we sit in, make small steps that we may hope are positive, but that we need to be ever vigilant. We need to look around after we have made those small steps and make adjustments and be adaptive to those changes. And so with many of the other authors that are here. Um, so it's not just that I have um, these people I think with, these people I have, have read and studied, um, but also when you do this kind of work, um, you couldn't do this kind of work by yourself. So I've done this work with a large number of collaborators and community, and I would like to call out especially um, Alan Borning and Dave Hendry and Lisa Nathan, who have um, worked with me, each of them for close to a decade, in some cases more than a decade, and a large number of other individuals who have contributed ideas, collaborated on projects, um, and there are more, more of you who are beginning to take up some of these ideas and use them in your own work, extend them, adapt them, um, and become part of this larger community. So to do this kind of work, it's the work that a collective does, that a community does. 
So what does this work look like? Um, the first large part of my career, I've spent um, developing something called value-sensitive design. Now, value-sensitive design is an interactional theory and method that accounts for human values in a principled and structured manner throughout the design process. I didn't actually set out to do this work. In fact, um, when I was first beginning to work in this area, I was a software engineer. I was working on educational software. And essentially, I was looking for some methods to help me design things that I thought were more likely to be beneficial than not. Um, so I started looking around. And at that time, when I was working, um, I was very much attracted to participatory design. But when I looked at participatory design, it came out of a very particular context, the Scandinavian context, with strong labor unions, within organizations where there was clear management, clear employees. We knew who the organization was. Um, I also saw some very interesting work going on in CSCW. But again, this is workplace oriented, usually around small groups, and usually around a very similar set of values around privacy, reputation, uh, community awareness or sharing. And then there was work being done in social informatics, very good work looking at deployed technologies and what impact those technologies would have. But that knowledge was not so helpful if you wanted to be on the proactive side, if you wanted to be designing things up front. And then work being done by applied philosophers in what is now called computer ethics, um, where we have very clear working definitions of what some of the values are and some of the value implications. But again, these individuals are largely conceptual thinkers. They're not builders or designers. And so they supplied a very critical piece, but not help in how to go forward proactively in the design process. So that's where I found myself, with um, some small pieces to build from, but a large gap. And so the question is, if you're going to try to go forward on this project, what should you do? So one kind of thing you could do is you could decide that you're going to focus on privacy. You could become a specialist in that value, or you could pick another value, like trust. That's one that's been studied a bit, or more recently, sustainability. Another thing you could decide to do is you could decide to become a specialist on a certain kind of technology. You could decide that you're going to focus on values around mobile applications, or you're going to um, focus on a certain kind of um, input and output devices for um, disabled people. So all kinds of ways in which you could make decisions to focus. But what I was interested in developing would be a robust theory and method for addressing values and design. And as a strategy to do that, I didn't do any of those things. <laughs> what I decided to do was to work across a range of values, a range of technologies, and a range of levels in society as a way to avoid blind spots. Not so much that I would know what any of these blind spots were, but simply by choosing a very diverse set of research and design spaces and continuing to look for method that would work across these, that inadvertently through that process, we would be able to surface blind spots or work around those blind spots. And so that led to the study of a wide range of values. And one of the things that I um, discovered early on is when you start to look at technology and values in people's lived lives, that they're all quite interconnected. So when you pick up one value, you pick up a whole range of them. You can't really talk about um, privacy apart from talking about things like trust and security often. Or if you pick up um, things like freedom of expression, then um, issues around autonomy and perhaps dignity come with that as well. So by virtue of this approach, what we began to see is that one needs to study these values in the way in which they exist in people's lives and that they often exist in an interesting kind of tension together. Early in our work, we used to talk about value conflicts. But that word conflict seems to imply that there's something about those values working against each other. And um, I've come to prefer the term tension because it's often the case that those values coexist. And when things are in tension, sometimes two things in tension actually hold each other up. So tension doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be resolved, that it needs to go away, or that it's problematic. 
but it may mean that those things are sitting there in a delicate balance together and one needs to pay attention to that balance. And then we worked across a wide range of technology and design spaces. Um, so this slide shows you some of them. Uh, with Alan Borning, I've worked on large-scale urban simulation. With Kia Hick, I've uh, worked on um, privacy in public in Sweden and also in the United States. Um, with Jessica Miller on groupware systems. With Yoshi Kono and Tammy Denning on implantable medical devices. And the list goes on. Um, you can see that there are mobile phone applications. There's a little bit of um, robotics here. There's telepresence. And in a recent um, project with Abby Evans, starting to look at lots of data being generated from the Snow Leopard Trust. Um, so looking at sort of big data and um, protection of animals in the wild. And then also we have worked across levels, various levels of social analysis from the individual all the way up through the global. So what this shows you is work done largely at the individual level through small group organizations, looking in public spaces, moving up to social policy, and then to sort of more global perspectives. Um, the blue boxes indicate projects in which we were actually building technology of some sort. And the red boxes indicate that along with the technology, we were also engaged in some kind of policy or law, so co-evolving both the technology and the policy. So I'd like to give you a very quick sense of a couple projects. Um, one of our earlier projects uh, started around oh, 1998, 1999, was around informed consent cookies and web browser security. Around this time, there was a lot of press around browsers and a lot of upset in the public around people having control, not knowing what was going on on their machines with cookies. So this particular project started with the identification of the value of informed consent. The first piece of work that we did was to develop a model for informed consent online. The model had five components. And then we took that model as a set of criteria and we looked at the technical work that had been done um, in the interaction design community with web browsers from 1995 to 1999 in the two main browsers at the time, Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer. And what we did was we looked at all of the efforts that the community had been making to address these issues of informed consent, and we held those technical features up against the criteria for informed consent. And by looking at them analytically, you were able to see that even though um, sincere effort by industry in many cases was being made, that actually when you look at what it means to be informed and what it looked at what it means to actually be able to consent, that these mechanisms were falling short. So this very good conceptual model was an analytic tool for us to identify limitations and technical features um, that had been developed um, by our community over a long period of time. So then the question we asked ourselves was, well, can we do better? I mean, fine to critique, but the real question here is what can we design that will offer um, more? And so then we took that model, and instead of using that model as um, criteria for critique, we used it as criteria for design. We looked at where the gaps were, and then we asked ourselves, can we build mechanisms that will begin to address some of the gaps that we've identified here. And so the um, screenshot that you see um, at the top comes from a plugin that we designed for the Mozilla browser. And this particular plugin adds two kinds of features. One is a peripheral awareness feature. You can see this sidebar where there are these green and red bars. Every time a cookie is set, um, another bar indicating the cookie shows up there. If it's a third-party cookie, it's red. Those are the ones that people were disturbed about. But people wanted not only to know that these cookies were being set, but they also wanted to be able to take action. But they wanted to be able to take action when they were engaged in their browsing. So the other mechanism that we added was a just-in-time management mechanism. And so if you saw something in this peripheral awareness device um, that caught your attention, you could immediately click on it it would bring up the information about that particular cookie 
as much as the system had about that cookie, and then you could make choices to delete it, to keep it, to delete all cookies from that domain. And so in that way, we were able to improve upon um, informed consent, the ability to be informed about what was happening and also to take action um, in the web browser. And then there were still places where our design came up short with respect to the model for informed consent online. And we were able to identify those and show how they were resulting from the very nature of how the protocol had been designed. And that was beyond our control to go in and um, address. So that's one project, an example of the kind of work that we've done. The second project, The Watcher and the Watch, is work that was done first in the United States and then in Sweden. Now this particular project um, started because we were doing some research. We were interested in what would happen for people working in interior offices if they could have a large display that would give them access to a real-time scene in their local community. So for all those people who are working in you know, places without windows, could we give them, in effect, a window onto their local world, and what would the benefits be? That was the initial piece of research. But coming out of value-sensitive design, we've talked a lot about both direct and indirect stakeholders. Direct stakeholders are the people who touch the technology directly, so they would be those people in the offices with the um, interior offices with those plasma displays. But also we talk about indirect stakeholders. We talk about people who might be affected by a technology even though they might never touch it. So for example, with health or medical record systems, which doctors, um, insurance companies, orderlies might be able to access, often patients can't see their records directly. That may be changing. But that's an example of an indirect stakeholder. When we took that idea and applied it to the um, research that we were conducting, what immediately came to the fore were the people who were going to be walking across the scene whose images were going to be captured on this screen. So here we had, we actually booted me out of my office so that we could conduct this research, and we had put a large plasma display in the window of my office and mounted a camera on the university building. And now we have people walking across a plaza whose images, unbeknownst to them, were being shown in my office. So they were indirect stakeholders in this study. And because we had a commitment to the indirect stakeholders, our methods changed. So instead of just studying the people who are going to be interacting and potentially benefiting from this plasma display in their inside offices, we also went out and surveyed and interviewed the people who are walking through the scene. So the method itself um, structured our investigation such that this other population became a part of the research, a group that we would otherwise not have attended to. And then, because we also collected um, roughly data, roughly evenly, from men and women, we were able to do some analyses based on gender. And one of the key findings from this study is that from the perspective of the indirect stakeholder, the person walking across the scene, that women in the United States were far more troubled by this than men, far more uncomfortable. In fact, on the survey, women were more troubled than men on every item on the survey. We then um, took that research through conversation with, with um, Kia and her colleagues um, to Sweden and did a comparable study there and found some very interesting results. Um, so the Swedes, by and large, are overall less comfortable with this technology than the counterparts in the United States. But we also found gender differences there as well. And we were also able to take a coding manual that we had developed for the data in the United States and apply it to the Swedish interviews. So the interviews in Sweden were conducted in Swedish and coded by Swedes in Swedish. But we were able to see to what extent the coding manual, the categories, um, the reasons people gave for their discomfort in the United States um, were similar to or differed from the reasons that were given in Sweden. And an interesting finding there is that the overarching categories, the higher categories, remain the same. And then within subcategories, there were new categories that emerged so that it expanded and made a more comprehensive coding manual. So again, what this second project shows us 
is that by having method, by having structures or tools in our, in our toolkit for investigating um, values in our design of systems, that it can change the design process and surface for us things that we might otherwise not have been aware of at all. So we didn't go into this work thinking about those indirect stakeholders, and we didn't go into this work looking for gender differences, but we followed a process that legitimated the, the role of those indirect stakeholders in the design, and then that allowed it to come into the research. So stepping back from all of this, what I'd like to do is um, just give you a broad overview of what are some of the key theoretical constructs in value-sensitive design, and then a brief tour of some of the methods, very briefly, and then we'll segue to another topic. Um, so key to value-sensitive design is this interactional stance on um, technology. So the claim that the technology itself is not value neutral, but it is also the case that the technology does not determine human behavior. And as designers, we build in certain, we have to address the um, issues, the value issues within the technology, but it doesn't mean that we control everything about it. So design matters. It matters that we try to make the technologies we build accessible, but within larger social structures, there will be other kinds of constraints. When you think about um, and take seriously an interactional stance on technology, then it becomes apparent that you need to do these different kinds of investigations. So conceptually, what kinds of values, what, when we use these words like privacy or trust or community or calmness or kindness or human dignity, what are we talking about? So what are those actual, what are those words, what are those constructs? So there's a certain amount of work that we can do conceptually thinking about this work and that philosophy can inform those kinds of, um, those kinds of definitions. But still, ultimately, this is about human experience. And so at some point, one has to move from the conceptual work to working with the individuals who are going to be impacted by these technologies to understand what their experience of those technologies would be. And then, because we are interested in technology and tools, at some point, there's technical work. And as you saw from the cookies example, sometimes that technical work is looking at existing technologies and doing analyses to understand what the value implications might be. And other times, as you also saw with the cookies work, it's being proactive on the design and using those analyses to help us structure the design of new technology. And of course, with whatever we design, we still need to go back, no matter how thoughtful we think we are as the designers, to circle back to the people who will be impacted to see if their experience of the technology in the situations in which they're going to use it is what we intended. So in that cookies work, we went back to users to see, do they actually see and experience those features as giving them greater empowerment with respect to informed consent? I talked already about stakeholders, direct and indirect stakeholders and this idea that values do not exist in isolation, but in lived lives and in relation to each other in people's lived lives. And in looking at the levels of analysis, I hinted at the co-evolution of technology and social structure. I think that when we allow ourselves, when we give ourselves permission in the design space to consider both the tools and the larger social context in which those tools are used, and we draw a box for the design space that includes both, we have greater opportunity. So sometimes when you open things up, it may be that you can co-evolve a solution better by engaging some change within the social structure, or social policy, as well as with the technology together. And so going forward may offer um, additional opportunities. And finally, when we think about our work, um, going back to Habermas, we think about progress, not perfection. Um, the idea is, can we do a little bit better? And the claim here is that in designing technologies, they, there is not the option to design something that is value neutral. We could be unconscious about values in our design, in that sense of not explicitly addressing them. And one could make the argument that by not explicitly addressing values, we actually would do so in the best way. Somehow we would just intuitively know the best thing to do. Um, 
I suspect that that's not the case and that by having a good set of tools or methods to help us in the design process, we can actually do better. But it really is a discourse about better, not about right, not about best. And one way that I've personally found helpful to think about this is to think in terms of reliability. So can we design a reliable system? No. But that doesn't mean that we don't hold out reliability in the design of information systems as an ideal. And it doesn't mean that we don't work in the larger field of um, computer science, for example, in coming up with methods for making more reliable systems. And so by analogy, I would argue that we can use method to help us get better at addressing values in the design process. But by doing so, it means we hold on to that as an ideal, but we don't expect perfection from ourselves. And somehow, when we're talking about values, people want to go there. They want to know that it's right in a way where they're more willing with something like reliability or correctness to just say, well, it's more reliable and that's good, or it's more correct and that's good. And I think we need to be um, you know, honest with ourselves about what our capabilities are and what we understand and what we know how to do and hope that we can learn techniques for making things a little bit better. And that in and of itself, I think, is a good achievement for us. So then from theory comes the question of, well, what do you do? And um, over the course of the work that we've been doing, we've developed 14 methods that are honed for working with values in the design process. So I just want to point them out to you so that you see that they're here. Um, we've talked about direct and indirect stakeholders. We've done work where we explicitly um, distinguish designer values from the values that will be ex uh, explicitly supported by the system and then the stakeholder values. What you see in the um, bottom corner is a value sketch, a way of eliciting somebody's ideas about what they care about, not so much by asking them for their words, but by giving them opportunities, nonverbal ways to express um, things that matter to them. In this case, this comes from a study with homeless young people and their um, understandings about place and where they feel safe and unsafe, and then ways in which mobile technologies might be able to help them feel safer. Other kinds of methods we've looked at are how to introduce values into semi-structured interviews, um, looking at granular assessments of magnitude, scale, and proximity. So when we did the work on um, privacy in public, we looked at the magnitude of how widespread the information was. Um, we've talked about coding manuals. And in this case, we have used a value-oriented approach to a mock-up. So in work looking at implantable medical devices, so a pacemaker, for example, pacemakers are now wireless. And one of the implications of that is um, they are now hackable. Um, you have to be pretty close to them, but that may change. And so the security community is now beginning to look at how can you secure um, implantable medical devices. And so in this work, what we've done is looked at some of the early security concepts coming out of the security community. And often, those concepts and ideas don't come to um, patients or medical device providers until they're fairly far along in the development, in their technical development. Well, in this case, what we've tried to do is bring those early concepts both to patients and to medical device providers to get their input. And what you see in the image here, one of the proposals is for a tattoo, to have your password tattooed on your skin. Um, one version of that is a UV tattoo, and that's what you see demonstrated here. And you can imagine that from some patients, um, that particular solution is problematic, both for historical and personal and cultural reasons. Um, so this kind of work, this way of using values and integrating them into the kinds of prototypes that we use is an effective way for getting feedback from um, stakeholders on particular proposed designs. And then we've talked about the model for informed consent, some other methods dealing with value dams and flows. And um, most recently, some of the work we've done has involved the envisioning cards. And here, what we've tried to do is develop a toolkit that can be used in an agile way in industry. Um, 
So just to give you a, a brief sense of what the, this toolkit is like, it consists of 32 cards. Each card has um, on one side an image and then a title. And then on the flip side, there are categories of stakeholders. So again, those direct and indirect stakeholders. Time, so asking designers to think about not just now, but longer into the future. Different kinds of values and also pervasiveness. What happens when this technology would be taken up, not just by a few people, which is often the context in which we study it, but even as we're designing our technologies, can we think about 100,000 or a million or a billion people using that technology? What would the implications be? Each card has on it a theme that's discussed and then a very specific um, design action that you can take. And you can use these cards for any number of purposes. We tried to design them to be simple, to be versatile, um, beautiful, so you want to hold on to them. They are persistent, so you can tack them on the wall. You can use them for ideation. You can use them for heuristic critique. You can use them as criteria for evaluation. You can use them working with clients when you want to help a client understand a particular concept or idea, um, and on and on in co-design processes. So um, it's a tool that is just beginning to be shared with the community, and um, we expect others will discover new uses for them. Just to give one idea of a use, um, this particular card is called Crossing National Boundaries. Um, I had an opportunity to think about crowd, um, cloud computing in, um, in a setting where there were some security researchers and others. And I used this card as a value heuristic um, to talk about some of the issues with cloud computing. So this card says nations have different rules, customs, and infrastructure that affect the use of the technology. So when I took that card and I thought about cloud computing, some of the issues that um, surfaced for me and came out in the discussion had to do with all of a sudden taking into account um, intellectual property that crosses from one country to another. We're moving data and machines from one country to another. What happens to the intellectual property? Um, what about speech? What about speech that um, something that you say in one country and is non-problematic, and yet when it moves into the cloud, the very thing that you've spoken is now in another context in which that speech is now problematic. So those are the kinds of issues that surfaced from this particular card in that context. So what we've done so far and, and what I hope you have um, seen is a fairly robust theory and method for trying to get at um, engaging with values in the design process, proactively in the design process with technology. And um, so for myself, you know, I've also spent time looking at other people's careers, and I think you see researchers, um, some researchers who develop an idea early on in their career, and you'll see that they spend the rest of their career elaborating on that idea. And then if you follow other careers, you'll see there are some people who seem to have a big idea and they develop that for a while, and then they get another big idea and they develop that for a while. I think it raises a really interesting question. Both are very viable and important careers, but different ways in which one can think about having um, a research life or, or, or one's own intellectual um, vitality. So what I noticed after about, oh, maybe 20 years past my PhD was that it had been a long time since I had actually stepped back and um, done what I referred to as facing the void. So when I was a graduate student, as many of you probably remember as graduate students, um, those of you who've completed your PhDs and those of you who are on your way, I thought the hardest part was the dissertation proposal. The hardest part was looking at everything there is of value and interest in the world to study and trying to pick one key thing that would be really interesting, really important, and small enough that you could actually do. <laughs> um, and at least when I was in graduate school, we talked about that as facing the void. So you just hang there in the void until finally somehow this idea emerged. So 
what I experienced after that and once I started working in value sense of design was that one problem, one question led naturally to another suite of problems or questions. And there was a way in which we could just keep working. Um, but what I was interested in was, well, what would happen if I just stopped? What would happen if I let myself face the void again? If I just sort of emptied out the plate, gave myself permission um, not to do the next piece of research? What would that be like? What would come out of that space? So I had a sabbatical in um, 2007, and that was, the, um, that was the project I gave myself to create space and see what happens. So I spent a good part of that time in the company of uh, Lisa Nathan and Sean Kane and Hedja Klasna, who were graduate students at that time, and we spent a good deal of time with previous work that had been done in value sense of design, and we sat with it. We thought about um, what we liked about it. We thought about what we didn't like about it, where we thought there were maybe shortcomings or new questions. Um, and we just left a lot of space. So there wasn't, there wasn't an agenda. There wasn't an agenda to do anything. There wasn't a piece of research that we needed to do. We just sort of let it be. And towards the end of that year, what emerged for me out of that was beginning to think about um, problems, problems that we were unlikely to solve within a single human lifespan. All of the problems that I had been working on prior to that point were relatively contained within time. And so what emerged for me from that process is something that we've called multi-lifespan information system design. And so the basic idea here is that there are certain categories of problems that we're unlikely to solve within a single human lifespan. So for example, um, healing from cyclical violence. So if I've killed your babies and you've killed mine, what's the likelihood that we can create a lasting peace? Probably not. Maybe we can agree that the children we still have can stay alive. And maybe their children can grow up feeling physically safe, and maybe it's their children, that third generation, who are really in a position to create a lasting peace. And to the extent that we try to do so in shorter time frames leads to very brittle solutions. So one category of problem has to do with limitations of the human psyche, and what are our capabilities as human beings to be able to um, repair and reconcile and to heal from that kind of violence. A second category has to do with um, tears in the human fabric. So if we think about things like HIV AIDS that can wipe out huge segments of a population between the ages of 20 and 50, those societies have lost um, an enormous part of their infrastructure, the social infrastructure, the human beings who educate the young, take care of the elderly, share knowledge, mentor in between and along, along those age ranges. They carry on a lot of the structure and social activity in the society. So that's another kind of problem. It will, as the new generations come along, repair itself over time, but what can be done in that interim? And then a third category of problem has to do with um, environmental issues that may proceed at a slower time scale. So regrowth of um, forests, um, water, um, all kinds of issues that have to do on the environmental scale. So then how do you come to that as someone who works with information systems? You know, what is the role of the information scientist in these problems? And I think from there the question becomes, well, what are the role of information systems in helping to support these solutions as they unfold over longer periods of time? And so that becomes the interesting research question. And from that one asks, well, what should the design process be? Because if you look at most of our design work, we design in three weeks to six months, we deploy for 18 months, and we consider it obsolete in five years. So now we're talking about problems that are going to last much longer than any one of us as a designer, for which we are looking for information solutions that will help support those solutions as they unfold. What should that design process be? And so from that, um, 
the idea is, well, let's populate this space with some projects and see what kind of process we can go through, what kind of progress we can make. And of course, with a research program frame like this, I'm not going to be here to know what happens. <laughs> I'll be here to get some of these started. And then these problems and the information systems as they follow them will carry on long past myself. So a fundamental part of this design process is creating things in a way so that they can be passed from one person to another and so that they can move forward. Um, so in thinking about a project, we've worked on um, societal healing from widespread cyclical violence. And we've worked particularly in Rwanda with the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So what I'd like to do for a minute is take you back to 1994. I'd like you to think for a minute about where you were in the spring of 1994. And some of you were quite young at that time, but others of you, not so. In 1994, in the spring in Rwanda, which is a small country in East Africa about the size of Vermont, for those of you who know that state, 800,000 people were massacred in 100 days by their countrymen. Um, and they were massacred for the most part by machete and club to death. So this was face-to-face -face, um, killing that went on. A very complex situation, which I won't go into, I won't discuss all of the politics behind it, but one result from that was that a little bit later, the United Nations established the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. This is one of the first experiments in a system of international justice, this and the one for the former Yugoslavia, also established at that time. And the first international criminal tribunals since the very first one, which was for Nuremberg. So you can think of this as an experiment in what international justice might be. And just as people might be interested in what the people who are writing, say, the US Constitution were thinking and the socio-political constraints there when we were first doing experiments in democracy, in certain ways we stand in relation to notions of international justice in the same way. So we entered this project um, at the time when the tri Tribunal for Rwanda was beginning to wind down and asked to, um, we came, we had an opportunity to come to the tribunal, which is located in Arusha, and to hear some of the stories that were being told by the people who put that tribunal together. As part of those stories, we heard things that we thought other people in the world would like to hear, not just now, but 50 or 100 years from now. Perhaps things that people in Rwanda would like to hear. And the communication between the tribunal and the Rwandans was fairly limited. So what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit about this project, let you listen to some of the stories, and then um, close. We are privileged. We are privileged people for having been called to participate in the administration of international justice. In Africa now, even leaders who violate human rights. They talk in the language of human rights. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives. And these people would never have the opportunity to be heard. So we ought to be their voice. We have to talk for them. She had courage to testify. There are many survivors. From the judges down to the cleaners, each of us is only an element of a chain. Each of us has an important role to play. So what you see there are um, voices from the 49 people that we interviewed, from prosecutors, defense counsel, judges, wardens, investigators who were in the field, translators. Um, in something that was quite unusual, we found out that the tribunal was going to wind down in December of 2008, and we found that out in the middle of June. So within about 10 weeks, we pulled together a team of um, some information scientists, um, some videographers, and uh, a legal team to go to the tribunal in the early fall to conduct these interviews. And over six weeks, we were able to interview 49 individuals. All of our work was done independent of the United Nations or the ICTR. Everything that was recorded 
was not reviewed by anyone other than the person who was giving the interview, and then we left. So all of these um, interviews are people's personal reflections. They are, unlike oral history, not so much about um, verifying what happened at the tribunal, but we asked people to speak to what they wanted the Rwandan people to know and what they wanted people on the globe to know um, now and 50 or 100 years from now. We also asked them not to tell us anything confidential or anything that would jeopardize a witness or a case because our intention was to make these materials as widely accessible as possible um, and to make them available for reuse so that people could um, use these materials in ways that would be important to them in their lives. So let me give you um, just a sense of what one of these interviews, a little snippet of an interview, so you have a little bit more of a sense of what this content might be like. Um, I'd like to share with you a clip from Roland Amasuga. He's a spokesperson for the tribunal. Uh, he was one of the people that the UN called in before the genocide was called a genocide. He was brought in to document things had gone on such that the term genocide could be applied, such that a tribunal could be created. Um, and the story that he's telling here is with a witness during um, one of the very early trials. Being a chief of witness protection, the first time I cried in this court was the day I brought in an old lady, 85 years old lady, whose kids were all killed, husband killed, and she was raped. And I brought her in court here to testify in the first case. And this lady, I did not speak Kinyarwanda. Uh, I used interpreter. We developed a kind of special relationship. She was so funny. You will, never, you will never believe what she went through. And when she entered the courtroom, we prepared her when she entered the courtroom. She, she was smiling. And then when they asked her, witness, could you identify the accused person? The old mama stood up, walked, went to see the prosecutor's face, they were all white. Look at them, look at one of the few blacks in the team of the prosecutor. She moves away, she looks at the court reporter, she moves away, she looks at the judges, she moves away, she looks at the registry members, she moves away, she looks at the defense counsel, she moves away, she looks at the accused person, she moves away. And when she came again to see the accused person, she bowed to the accused person. And she went back and sit and said, where is the accused person? He's there. Who? Who are you talking about? He's there. The judge said, can you point the finger? Say, in my culture, you don't point the finger to powerful people. <laughs> said, no. He was the mayor. And the mayor was the most powerful. And the court agreed to agree that the lady has recognized the accused person on the basis of that sign. And then when we went home, I said, Mama, how do you feel? I'm so happy. I could not believe that I'll have this day in my life to see the Son of God to be there with handcuff. No, it's not possible. I can die today and go and see my kids and report back to them that justice is being done. So you see in that clip with Mr. Amasuga that there are very many ways in which different people could um, respond to that clip. So for example, um, a Rwandan person who was trying to decide if they were going to testify at this tribunal, this strange Western legal system in Arusha might be wondering how they would be treated, if they would be heard, if their ways of communicating would be listened to. So a clip like this might speak to some of those questions. It might be the kind of thing that um, one could watch and have a discussion about if one was contemplating whether or not to participate in the tribunal. 
or if one was wondering what kind of evidence was accepted in the tribunal. Um, for those who are building other international tribunals, and, and sadly we will likely have some if you think of things going on in the Sudan and Congo and other places, um, there's a lot of learning that can go on here. So in these places, people who are running the courts may be wondering about how they can accept and work on and prepare for different ways of people communicating. And so that ties into um, the court administration and ways in which judicial knowledge is integrated into the court system and how agile the court can be in doing that. And there was definitely quite a lot of learning of that that went on at the tribunal itself. And then another group that might generally be of interest in this kind of work um, are just the population at large. High school students who are learning about systems of justice, various systems of justice, may also have interest here. So in doing the work that we've done, we have, um, there are several kinds of innovative features. One is that for a historic collection like this, um, usually these things are kept in special collections. You have to have special permissions to come see them. You wouldn't have access to them. So this um, collection is, in its entirety, is viewable on the web. And that in and of itself goes beyond what most collections of this sort have done in the past. Not only is it there on the web, but we've released it in its entirety under a Creative Commons license, attribution only. So you can go to the website, you can um, stream it if you have good bandwidth. Um, if you have moderate bandwidth, you can download it. And if you have very little bandwidth, as is often the case in Rwanda, you can get the audio only. And then whatever piece you have, if you have some reason to use it, some purpose, then you can take that and use it. And all we ask is that you attribute the collection and that you make sure that the interpretation of the materials are your own. But it's also the case, you know, think about Foucault here, that people who control the language control the power. And that often resides in the hands of the curators. And typically, again, there's a very elite group who would be curating a collection like this. So we've begun a process, and we're only at the very beginning of it, of um, opening things up for public curation. So if you go onto the website, you can contribute keywords in one of three languages, Kenya, Rwanda, English, or French. And we also ask if you would like to tell us a little bit about your demographic. So the hope is that over time, as people use the system, we might be able to say for a clip like the one you just saw of Mr. Amasuga, if you're a Rwandan who lived through the genocide and you look at this clip, these are the kinds of words that you think are important to associate with it. And those words might be very different than the kind of words that someone who comes from a legal or human rights background might use. And so we're trying to find ways in which one kind of language isn't privileged in um, providing access and characterization of what the materials are about. And then there's another um, issue that has to do with discussion or how you speak. If you go onto the site coming from our community, one of the things that would seem very odd is that there's no online discussion forum. There's no place for you to go where you can type in your own thoughts or reflect or share your thoughts with someone else. And that um, might strike you as very strange. However, in Rwanda today, there is a genocide ideology law which is very strict. And so if someone in the states here in Texas were to write something that violated that law and a Rwandan were looking at the site and someone saw that, that Rwandan might be subject to the genocide ideology law and potentially incarcerated for up to 25 years. And not only that, the place where that person was looking at the website, so perhaps an internet cafe, perhaps some other kind of organization, would also be subject to the genocide ideology law. And so perhaps that organization could be shut down. So these are the fears that our Rwandan partners have expressed. And in response to that, there is no online discussion forum. Instead, where we've drawn the line is we've said that every person at the tribunal who contributed to an interview their speech is speech that we will allow to be spoken. And then what anyone can do is you can go onto the um, website and view any part of the collection. And if you find something, if someone says something that you think is really important, 
then what you're able to do is you can um, indicate where in the clip that started, why you think it's important, and submit that to our project team, and then we will turn it into a highlight. And on the website, it looks like every other highlight. So there are, for example, highlights in the collection that someone in the online public has contributed. They chose not to self-identify, and that's fine. And in that way, the online public can determine what aspects, what material in this collection are really important for other people to hear. And so again, we've tried to, thinking about power, take the power out of our hands as the people who are currently the custodian for the interviews themselves, but open that up to the online public. Um, in 2009, we were in Rwanda, and we worked with um, Rwandans to ask them about how these materials might be meaningful to them to help us resolve a number of policy issues about translation into Kenya Rwanda and um, a range of things. At that time, we ran a workshop with youth on peace and justice through film. And in a really marvelous and heartwarming way, while we introduced them to concepts of international justice through the videos, when we put the cameras in the kids' hands and asked them what they wanted to do, they wanted to make films about the beauty of Rwanda. They wanted to show how the Rwandan domestic courts are strong now, that they, though they were decimated 15 years before, that they're going forward and that um, Rwandan autonomy in justice systems should be supported. And that's the kind of societal healing and going forward that we hope information systems can help um, support. And I'll return to that point in just a moment. Someone else saw the, one of the clips an organization called Hope After Rape, and said to us, um, we can use that. They called us up four or five days later and said they had been to Goma in Congo and were running a conference there. Could we come? Could we take these materials? And one of my graduate students went and was able to use the materials there with some very recent victims from sexual violence in the Congo. And according to our partners, the materials were helpful in creating conditions in which those individuals felt comfortable speaking. There's a high school in um, the state of Washington that will be using the materials um, with a sophomore class on world history. So again, another way in which these materials can speak and educate another generation. In six days, we'll be returning to Rwanda, and then we'll be working with a partner from Friends Peace House. We'll be working with two generations of Rwandans um, with those who lived through the genocide and workshops with both perpetrators and survivors, and then also with youth, those born after the genocide, the children of perpetrators and survivors. And we'll be asking them to look at some of these materials and tell us what their both words are, concepts are for the things that they're seeing, but also why or to whom they think it might matter and to what purposes. And what we hope to do with that research is to begin to understand this generational change that may happen from those who have lived through the violence themselves from the generations that follow. And so the information design challenge is that as we build systems around this kind of material, that we don't hold people, we don't hold that generation, that younger generation back into the um, direct experiences, words, concepts of those who lived through the violence, but allow them to heal, allow them to go forward. And so that will be um, the research agenda that we'll be engaging in. So I'd like to stop now and invite your questions. I actually have quite a few more things I'd like to say, but I'd like to provide an opportunity for um, conversation. So let me conclude at this point. Thank you. I believe questions, um, if you have some just to come or comments you'd like to make, please come up to the microphones and um, Hi, Batya. Hi, so ben. first of all, thank them, Ben Peterson from the University of Maryland. Thank you very much for all of your work and an incredibly uh, uh, strong presentation, putting a lot of things together. Um, my question is, I'm curious what the university's response to this work is. Um, I can wondering if you can just say a little bit about what are the challenges in doing this kind of work, where, what, how was it appreciated, how wasn't it appreciated? Mm -hmm. 
So the university's response has been incredibly positive. I mentioned that um, in the middle of June of 2008, we learned the tribunal was winding down. Um, and we left uh, September 27th. From June 15th to September 27th, um, the university, after we received some initial um, funding from NSF, which I think was really crucial, the university um, contributed funding directly. Um, human subjects approved the process. I think um, the staff at the information school where I work bent over backwards to, um, you know, we bought you know, very expensive camera equipment. That's why the quality of the videos are so good to support all of that purchasing and processing of um, going forward. And <clears throat> I think um, this is how I understood it, which is I think this project captured the imagination of everyone. And I think each person felt like, well, it's sort of impossible. You can't do this in 10 weeks. You can't get this team together and go. But I think everybody said, but it's not going to be my bit that stops it. And so um, we had an incredible response. And the university has continued to support it. The um, original um, videos are on hard disks that have never touched the net, and they reside in the special collections of the UW Library, and they're very much interested in being long-term custodians for that original collection. And that's important um, because it, even as we release this, we haven't talked about this, but even as we release this under a Creative Commons license, Imagine all the manipulations that could happen digitally. So keeping the originals um, very protected allows us to protect against a revisionist history. Yeah. Jennifer Red, Jefferson University. Hey, I, Jennifer. Um, I really love your work, and I was curious. One of the advices that you often get as young tenure track faculty is to not touch controversial topics and. I was curious what your advice was to young scholars to actually do useful work that is controversial, like what you've been doing. Great. That was one of the things I wanted to say but didn't have time for. Uh, so thank you, Jennifer. Yes. Yeah, so I think um, choose problems that are societally significant. Choose problems that matter. But I think scope is really important. I think you need to um, match to where you are in your own intellectual development. And um, out of grad school, I wasn't intellectually mature enough to do a project like the Tribunal Voices Project. Um, so uh, as a field, I think we need to think really hard about how we ensure intellectual maturation that as scholars, as, as we grow older as scholars, in fact, we take on more compelling or larger things. So my comment is always to push yourself, um, but the scale, you know, when you're a younger scholar, you have to pay attention to time. So, so pick something that's tractable to you within the time frame that you have and within um, where you are in terms of your own intellectual development, right? So there's only so much complexity. I think as you develop and mature as a scholar, as a researcher, there's a way in which you can engage with greater complexity, or at least I feel that personally in my life. So I would say know yourself intellectually and then choose something that you really care about there and work on it. Um, and in all of the work that I've done, I don't think I have encountered resistance at all in terms of any of the topics being um, overly controversial, at least from the institutions. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Alan Barney, University of Washington. Um, where is it, um, where, where, where should this work be published? And are there implications for what Kai should do? I'm thinking about, you know, the, the SIG on reviewing this afternoon, for example. Oh, Alan, thank you for that question. So, um, <laughs> we didn't prearrange this, by the way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think, um, so what is it? So this is great. What is an intellectual contribution, right? Um, I think for this kind of work, it's going to be very, very different than what we're used to seeing. So for example, I think a critical contribution from this work of what we've learned so far is the notion of offering. Um, with this work, when we work with our Rwandan partners, we offer. <laughs> we find out 
what they're doing, what they care about, what's important to them. And then we offer these materials, and in some cases, there's something useful. And then um, we try to pursue what that is, and we try to do the information design to help enable what those things might be. Um, I don't think that's a very typical um, CHI contribution, and yet I think it's probably one of the most significant things that we've learned at this point um, that I would say to others. I think that when you're talking about this kind of work, um, thinking about what can you in the near term look at in terms of um, an indicator of success, like does success even make sense? I don't know that success makes sense. Right now for ourselves, we are looking at things like um, to what extent do Rwandans want to use this material? To what extent um, is there appropriation? So for example, the Kigali Memorial Center would like these materials as part of their justice database. That's a strong indicator of success because the stakeholders want ownership. Um, do they continue to use the materials after we go away? That might be another indicator. But Really, this is a small piece of a very large societal issue around healing to which we're contributing a very small bit. And so I think even in the beginning of trying very new research approaches, just descriptive material is really important to the community. And that we ought to allow for research contributions that are just descriptions of things that happened, real reports that let us know well, we're really not in a position to evaluate yet. I wouldn't honestly be able to tell you. So I do think those things really do need to change to accommodate work of this sort. And of course, not everyone at CHI needs to do work of this sort, but for this kind of work. Hi, Bacha, Lauren Germain. Um, following up on Alan's question and your answer, I would presume that you would think that um, it makes sense that much or some work that you do may be appropriately published, not at CHI, but at other places as well, presumably. Yes, and in fact, for example, we are thinking of publishing something on the um, Journal of Transaction Transitional Justice. Mm -hmm. So here's something to think about. If you have the very best justice system here in the world, you do great justice, and the victims don't know about it, did you do justice? So information systems have a huge role to play in actually making sure that justice happens because it's the information systems in whatever form they take um, that inform back to the victims and the perpetrators what the result of that justice system was. And um, systems of justice have not necessarily done a good job in that communication piece. So there's actually a huge amount for um, a human computer interaction community, people working in communication and information systems um, to be contributing to um, justice. Yeah. So we have time for one more question, and we have mm -hmm. to have somebody to ask it. Great. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jen Kovnas. I work at Google. I'm a mm -hmm. product manager at YouTube. Um, one of the things I think about a lot in my job is as people keep uploading their lives and their experiences shared to the web, you know, what happens over time. Like I went to an excellent talk yesterday about sort of the post-mortem interval um, and sort of what happens with your online history. And I'm wondering what considerations you gave for flexibility for the coming changes in technology and changes in value system as they're you know, inevitably going to change and how we can ensure, so say for example, I go on and I write keywords in 2012 to match to these videos. But what that means to somebody in 2022 is probably gonna be very different. So how do you build this sort of timeline and effect into the technology platform? So um, that's what we're learning. <laughs> so, um, so we don't have a, an answer as much as we have a question. And, and what we have is a proactive stance, but that's the expectation. The expectation is that this will go forward. The expectation is that people will be interested in knowing what were the words that one, the people who lived through that experience used versus 50 years from now, people within, say, Rwandan society, what words they're using. I mean, that will be of huge interest in how to, how to display and juxtapose those together and what things need to be, um, become less salient over time in order to ultimately be constructive for that society. But those are the open research questions. So to that I would say, you know, like join the research enterprise. <laughs> and um, those are the things that, that 
we will slowly be, um, be exploring. And one of the other things I, I did want to say perhaps in, in closing here is um, there, the multi-lifespan information system design framing, one of the things that it offers us is permission to work slowly and to wait. You know, if you don't know, if you don't feel in your gut that you know what the right next step is, you can just sit. And somehow what I've been struck by is that even as we have been moving very slowly, um, in some sense, we've been moving quite quickly. So it's three and a half years since we were in Rwanda, and we collected this. We've been able to store it, secure it. Um, we've been able to release the entire collection under this Creative Commons license. We've built relationships with partners in Rwanda that we didn't have going in. It's actually quite a lot to achieve in a three and a half year period, and yet um, throughout, I think we felt that we were working slowly and many, many hard policy decisions where when we didn't know what to do, we just sat back. We waited, we listened, we talked to more people. So I think that that's a really important piece of the process and that a multi-lifespan framing, you know, gives you room to do that within the design process. Well, please join me in once again thanking Bacha.